It's 1030 now. What, what are you looking for? Uh, 1130. Pretty long service today. So it was... Yeah, but I got I to gotta get down and do some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, uh, let's pray and then dive in here. Father God, thank you for today, for my brothers and sisters, and the opportunity to explore your word. I pray you will give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you want to wait a little longer in the back door, just in case? Or? No, you can go ahead. Go ahead and shut it. Well, I, do, I usually need the kids to think first, you don't hear them, and then you can change the trash. All right, so we are... Uh, finishing up Isaiah 32 today and then getting into 33 by the grace of God. <laughs> uh, all the best laid plans. My original plan for this was, you know, maybe get through Isaiah in like 16 weeks or something. And here we are. <laughs> you Isaiah 32. We're still on 32. I had us down 1 through 8 last week. Right. Right. So uh, how about uh, uh, we read uh, 32, 9 through 20. Uh, maybe if somebody could get like 9 through, 5, 9 through 14 and some, or no, 9 through 15 and someone else 16 through 20, please. Read it. Rise up, you women who are our ease. Hear my voice. Your complacent daughters give ear to my speech. In a little more than a year, you will shudder, your complacent women, for the great harvest fails, the fruit harvest will not come. Tremble, young, tremble, you women who are at ease. Shudder, your complacent ones. Strip and make yourselves bare, and tie sack cloth around your waist. Beat your breast for the uh, pleasant fields, for the uh, fruitful vine, for the soil of my people growing up in thorns and briars. Yes, for all the uh, joyous houses in the exalted city, for the place is uh, forsaken, the populous city deserted. The hill and the watchtower will become dens forever. A joy of wild donkeys and a, a pasture of flocks until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high. And the wilderness comes uh, a fruitful field and the fruitful field is green before it. Then <coughs> justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness abide in the fruit field. fruitful field. And the uh, effective effect on the righteousness be peace, and the result of righteousness, quietness, and trust forever. My people will abide in a peace, uh, peaceful habitation, and secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. And it will hail when the forest falls down, and the city will be utterly laid low. Did you say through 19? Well, yeah, at this point, yeah, just finish the chapter happy there. Are, happy are you who sow beside all waters, who let the feed of the ox in that donkey range free. All right. So one of the things that uh, between studying Isaiah here and the class that I'm doing on with the Institute uh, for Spiritual Growth on the teachings of Jesus is realizing some of the fundamental differences between the Western mind and the Eastern mind. And uh, I may have covered some of this last week, but that's okay. It's a kind of a... a work in progress as I'm formulating my thoughts here. One of the, one of the traits of the Western mind, that's like really Western European uh, that we inherited uh, when uh, America was colonized. And uh, so um, 
the United States and Canada, you know, kind of the, the descendants of the Western Europeans, we, we have a tendency to highly value precision. Okay. We, we, we love precision. Uh, you see this, especially in terms of time, how, how we treat time. Um, in, uh, in the United States, if you tell somebody we're going to start at 1030, the expectation is everybody's here at 1025, ready to go and start at 1030. Okay. Have you ever heard the expression? If you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. If you're late, then you're really late. This is uh, part of our uh, world inherited worldview. And, and this is just one illustration of this value of precision. Uh, the rest of the world, especially in terms of time, whether the uh, Eastern, you know, Asia, Africa, South America, Time is relative, you know, uh, 1030. Yeah, that's a suggestion, but we start when everybody gets there, you know, um, and, uh, like on the mission field or in the business world, there's like conflicts when, you know, like if you're on a mission field and you say, and you tell all the Americans, all right, we're going to start at eight. The Americans are there ready to go at eight. Well, the uh, people from the other parts of the world are like, well, yeah, we're getting there at eight. <laughs> you know, it's uh, so this value of precision. Um, now, I've, I've noticed how this impacts our reading of scripture. Because uh, when we look at the teachings of Jesus, of course, you have all the parables. And parables are figurative. Uh, uh, they are stories that illustrate greater truths. Uh, you have sometimes Jesus would use overstatement or hyperbole. Okay, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it in the fire. It's better to enter heaven with one hand than two hands and on your way to hell. Now, Westerners, we come along and say, okay, does, does that mean I really, does he really want me to cut off my, no, Jesus doesn't want you to cut off your hand. He's making a point about the gravity, the seriousness of sin. He would rather you stop doing the sin <laughs> than have to cut off your hand to stop yourself from doing it. And so the, the Eastern mind, the Eastern world gets this. Uh, I use an illustration uh, with uh, the class on Monday about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus stands up in repentance and says, I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I repay four times the amount. Okay, now I'm no accountant, but part of me is like, how does that work? You know, if all of his money is from tax collecting, and all of it is from cheating people, <laughs> how are you going to pay back four times when all you have is ill-gotten gains, especially after you've already given it half of it away. So the point isn't the uh, dollar amount to the penny of how much he gives away, but the sincerity of his repentance, he realizes the gravity of what he's done. He's going to seek to make amends. Um, but there... Is the expectation is not that okay? Well, if if it if the numbers get crunched and it works out, you only repaid three and a half times versus a full. Then you you didn't really repent. That's that's not the point. You understand? Now then we go to the prophets. Okay, uh, 
the uh, Psalms and the prophets are full of poetry. Just like we read here about um, these women who lie around at ease, who are smug, um, the, the fruit crops are going to fail and the harvest will never take place. There have been many times I've read the prophets and I've, been try I've tried to make precision, literal sense out of what exactly is happening here. But what if that's simply my Western mind having trouble with Eastern ways of, of talking about things? That, that maybe the, the point here is not the literal, the, you know, the, the land will be overgrown with thorns and briars, uh, the palace and city will be complete, you know, will be deserted. I mean, yeah, bad things are going to happen when Assyria comes and has a siege, but even there, Assyria puts the land under siege, but the palace isn't emptied. When the Babylonians come and do uh, succeed in their siege and enter Jerusalem, and they take a bunch of the people uh, away as prisoners, there's still people who stay in Jerusalem. Okay? It, it, Jerusalem doesn't become a total, complete ghost town. Now, the population is decimated, okay? But, yeah, the Babylonians left a governor there to administer this, this territory that they've conquered. So, sometimes our Western minds, we're trying to get precision where the Bible's not asking for precision. They're asking for uh, us to understand the gravity of what's happening. Okay. Uh, does that make sense? Amen. <laughs> All right. So, and we see this in some of the, in some of the prophecies. Uh, I mean, okay, it's all, Isaiah is all prophecy, but so within the, the realm of prophecy, you have, oh, that's not what I want. You have, uh, sometimes the prophet is preaching a sermon calling for either worship or repentance. All right, Jonah goes to Nineveh, repent, or God's going to, for 40 days, God's going to destroy the place. All right, it, it's a sermon provoking a response from the contemporaries. So when Isaiah says, okay, don't trust Egypt, <laughs> you know, my people have made a covenant with death, uh, you know, look to God, trust God, okay? Repent, you know, stop your looking to Egypt, worship God, trust him to deliver you. It's, a, it's calling for a response from his contemporaries. Now, within that, uh, sometimes the prophets will look to the past as a way of reminder, look at what God's done for us in the past. Look how he brought us out of Egypt. Look how he gave us the land. Look how he gave us the law. Look at all God's done. He, we can trust him in the past. We can trust him in the future. Sometimes it's, look what God did to Pharaoh. <laughs> in Egypt. You think he can't do that to us? We should repent. <laughs> um, so, sometimes the prophets will use these events in the past as types. Um, <coughs> so you have past events. Just, yeah, look at what happened. But sometimes the past is the illustration 
to bring about types of things that will happen again. So um, uh, creation becomes a type for new creation. Uh, the the flood or ex or Egypt becomes types for decreation or destruction. So if the if the prophet ever talks about yeah God will come over us like a flood, or the Babylonians will come on us like a flood, the Jewish people are going to be thinking flood Noah. Man, that was bad. <laughs> Okay, um, so just like uh, let's bring up a contemporary example. What are what are some of the major events in American history that kind of get brought up again and again? Like this could happen once again. Nine eleven. Nine eleven. Yeah, we we got attacked by terrorists. Now every terrorist threat is like this could be another nine eleven. Yeah. The virus that just happened. Somebody coughed or, oh, you know. Yeah. They, yeah. Just because someone gets a cold, you're all worried that they're in. Yeah. Um, what about what about Watergate? Mm -hmm. Every scandal becomes a gate. <laughs> Benghazi gate. Um, uh, documents gate. Mm -hmm. All right. Even going further back, you have the Civil War. Depression. People are very afraid. Yeah. Because there are still people here who have lived, yeah. lived that. Yeah. Yeah. Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. You know, so we we kind of get the sense, okay, we pull these events from the past. Like, oh, as it was then, it could be again. All right. Um, so the the prophets will do these things. So uh so you, when you read things, you look for these kinds of patterns when they refer to floods, waters, right? Um, when they refer to uh, Egypt and Exodus or the crossing of the Red Sea or the crossing of the Jordan. These are types of events that the prophets will use. Okay. Uh, sorry. No, please. Go ahead. Like I, I see a parallel, like the end of Judges, where people did what was right in their own eyes. Mm -hmm. That is the cultural mantra today, in my opinion. I may not be accurate, but I think I'm. Oh yeah. Ninety percent that you know, that like whatever is right in our own eyes, and yet we expect, if we expect anything from God or acknowledge God, we expect it to be good. Yeah. And if he's not good. Yeah. Corrupt. I mean, I'm not sure what to use, but yeah, I think that would be. A yeah, no, that's that's. Yeah, what does the the teacher in Ecclesiastes say? There is nothing. nothing new under the sun. Now, when it comes to prophecies regarding the future, sometimes they will. It'll be very similar. We'll use these events from the past to say, as it was then, so it will be in the future. But again, these are illustrations. Uh, so Jesus says, as in the days of Noah, one will be taken, one will be left. Or uh, no sign except for the sign of Jonah, as it's three days, okay? Now there, the, the Jonah thing, he's talking about the resurrection. Well, he's not saying that the Son of Man is going to be swallowed by a giant. But as Jonah was three days in the belly of a large fish, the Son of Man will be three days in the earth. It's an illustration. He is the one greater than Jonah, but just as Nineveh listened to Jonah's preaching, the people of his day weren't listening to his preaching. So... Some of these things, again, when we read, okay, this future judgment, um, even though there's calling back to an event in the past, doesn't mean that that future judgment is going to be literally like it was in the past, 
but th thematically um, or the gravity of it. Uh, so Peter talks about, you know, in Noah's day, the earth was destroyed by water and the future is going to be fire. by fire. But it's going to be just as devastating, even though it's going to be different. Okay. Also, in the future, you have uh, you have near term because again, mostly Isaiah is preaching to his people. He's not just okay. Let me just lay out this coded thing that's. It has nothing to do with, you know, you, you know like if, if I'm going to stand up and preach a sermon on Sunday morning, but tell all my audience, okay, this has nothing to do for you. This or just recording this for posterity so that 200 years later is going to make sense. <laughs> no, when they're going to be there to make sense to you. Right. So Isaiah is preaching to his audience. The Holy Spirit is using Isaiah, knowing that things are going to get recorded for posterity and speaking things that are greater than, so like when uh, Emmanuel, Isaiah is talking to the king. He says, okay, the, the enemy's coming and it's going to be bad, but I'll tell you what, before this woman right here gives birth, and before her son is old enough to know right from wrong, God's going to take care of these enemies. All right? And the name of the child is going to be Emmanuel as an illustration of the fact that God is with us. Holy Spirit, knowing more, is going to say, hey, this is a type of another woman who gives birth to a son who's really going to be God with us. But even there, that uh, using that contemporary event, it was different because the woman in Isaiah's day, she was not a virgin when she gave birth. She was a young maiden. She might have been a virgin at the time Isaiah pointed to her, but the, the son she had was a natural Mary was actually a virgin because the Holy Spirit conceived in her. So the fulfillment is like, but unlike the, uh, or the ultimate fulfillment was like, or unlike the near term fulfillment. <clears throat> so, these are all things we need to keep in mind as we read. And some of it, we don't necessarily know the ultimate fulfillment. How is that going to be like or unlike the near-term fulfillment? So there's, so the prophets prophesy that after Babylon, there's going to be a new exodus. God's going to restore his people. Okay? But we also know there's going to be an ultimate Restoring of God's people, where um, uh, the dwelling of God will be with human beings. Okay, so uh, and, and usually a lot of times they'll use that image of creation and recreation. The lion will lie down with the lamb, and the child will play in the the adder's den. But there's still debate, and uh, and as of okay, is is there going to be a literal fulfillment of some of these prophecies for the nation of Israel here on Earth, and a lot of times connected to uh, a, a millennial reign in the Book of Revelation? But then others argue that. Okay, even that is an imagery for heaven, for the new Jerusalem coming down that is going to be Jews and Gentiles all together. And there's, we, the other day, a friend of mine and I, we had, <laughs> we have a, had a, a spirited uh, conversation about that. Some things we 
we don't know for certain. And that bothers us sometimes because of the Western desire for precision. I'm like, but, but I want to know, God. I, I want to know for sure so I can tell everybody I'm right and you're wrong and write books and get you know all the fame. But sometimes it's like, hmm, God's going to do it. There's an argument then to the Eastern. You explain what, what, would the, what would the Eastern view, whereas we want to know, like the millennial, we want to know, you know the, this and that. The Eastern would just be, it's just going to happen, and don't worry about it, or what? Yeah, and I think in general, the Eastern view is more comfortable with ambiguity and fuzziness of language, and that they're not expecting precision the way we are. So, okay, a, a a millennial rain. A, a thousand, it's going to rain. A kingdom is going to be for a thousand years. The Western mind would think 1,000 years of 365 and a quarter days. Literally, you, you're going to count them up. It's going to be exactly 1,000 revolutions around the sun. The Eastern mind would be more comfortable saying, eh, maybe that's a round number saying a very long time. Mm -hmm. you know. I think our point of view is a great hindrance to understanding the Bible. Yeah. But you know, maybe to back up just a bit, you know, our points, our points of view are different. Sometimes my point of view will, or attitude will change. For example, when the Jews were captive in Egypt, of course, they were undergoing slavery. Uh, it must have been kind of all right because they were multiplying, you know. But they say, oh my goodness, all we got is cardiac weights. And then they get on the other side and they're out following Moses. And the future is vague to them. Okay, you owe, even if the past is not good, it's known. And I cook. I'm not sure about the future. Yeah. I, maybe I'll cook and maybe, yeah. maybe I'm going to be better off. But there's many things, whether or not you have a positive point of view or a negative point of view, means all the difference in the world. Yeah. So, to, so back to, to your point, um, Luke is likely a, a Greek uh, or, or definitely influenced by this kind of Western thought. He, he tells us at the beginning of his letters, I set out to write an orderly account. Okay. So Luke has, in the year that this person reigned, we know the precise date. Um, and it's, this happened, and then this happened, and this happened, and this happened. John, his account isn't necessarily in chronological order, according to what Luke tells us happened. Because John is, is organized thematically to show that Jesus is the Son of God. The, the all the I am's that's the organizing feat, uh, principle of John. So Luke in the synoptic gospels has Jesus clearing the temple later in his ministry. John front loads it because he's not just saying this is the chronological account, but this is a thematic account. These are events that happen in Jesus' life to show you who he is. Now, then we come along with, and we uh, try to do, uh, okay, we want to line, line them all up and say, oh, well, Jesus must have cleared the temple twice. Yeah, now, maybe, may, maybe I'm okay with saying, no, he, he cleared it once. John's just, he's not giving us the chronological account. 
He doesn't say he's given us a chronological account. He says, I wrote this so that you would know who Jesus is. Okay? Um, and and that, that bothers some Western-minded people because that's, that's not how we write people's biographies, is it? You know, imagine if you pulled up a biography of General Colin Powell and it starts out, okay, his childhood and then Desert Storm and then his uh, time in the, I don't know if he went to West Point or whatever, but, you know, <laughs> we're like, wait a minute, Desert Storm, that, that happened after he went to, went to officer training school. Why would you put Desert Storm before the other one? Well, if I was organizing it non court you know, uh, some other way, but we want biographies to be chronological. Yeah. I don't know if everyone in the room has uh, seen at least part of The Chosen or not, but I know one criticism that I heard at the very beginning was that it wasn't in chronological order. It begins with Jesus healing uh, Mary Magdalene. You know, casting demons out of her. Well, that wasn't first. His birth was first. Well, okay. But does that does that diminish the power of the chosen? No. Yeah. Because it's not in chronological order. Yeah. Then let's, let's can't, we can't meld this with John's sermon at this point. Okay, and that like so we like the precision maybe for the judging. Hmm. As opposed to, we don't like the ambiguity of, uh, you know. And <laughs> that it, is a very good point. Uh, uh, <laughs> would you, what did you say? 27th of August, okay. <laughs> but, you know, the, the point being is, but then there's also where we see things have gotten really sloppy because of the ambiguity, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Love is the thing now. But, you know, love, one word, Western, is quite a bit different than love, well, three or four words. Mm -hmm. You know, the other In, in Greek, yes. Yeah, do you, do you see what I'm, the point of where I'm getting in? And it seems like that's kind of the struggle sometimes with maturing in faith, in that some people, I've gotten the feeling that they, ah, forget, it's impossible. Just, you know, yeah. don't worry about it. Just go to church. Did you, did you, yeah, no, I, I totally. So you think about the Pharisees versus Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. The Pharisees measured righteousness by actions. So you don't commit adultery. I, I don't commit adultery. I don't uh, have uh, intercourse with somebody else's wife. Therefore, I am righteous. Jesus says, if you even think about doing it, you're you're committing it. Well, but but I, I can't I can't look at Jeff and know whether or not he's thought about it. So I don't know if Jeff is righteous. Well, that's it's not the point that I should know whether or not Jeff is righteous. The point is <laughs> my own righteousness. And yes, yes. Yes. And how serious that yeah that act is, you know, and the yeah, the act or, or even the thought, the and heart. It's such yeah. a serious thing to our life and our society and who we are yeah. that we aren't even to think about. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't it be a lot simpler if you can measure your relationship with God by your diet? No. <laughs> no, but, but I... I but I mean that is like, okay, I eat certain foods, I avoid certain foods, I'm right with God. But then Jesus says, what goes in you doesn't make you clean or unclean, but what comes out? Oh my, that, that is far worse than what I put in. There's not, not any scale yeah. that you come up with. Yeah, so it is murkier. It is the, the kingdom of, of God is 
wheat and weeds growing up together. God's going to sort them out, not me. And so, yeah, we, there's precision. Um, the desire for control is, is part of this. Uh, and the church has a long history of this. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church. We can't translate the Latin Bible into the common language because people are going to read them and they might get ideas different than ours. And I, I look at the Catholic Church and I judge them. I'm like, oh, I can't believe they would do that. But then when it comes to uh, our small groups, oh, you know, I... I kind of like making the curriculum and everybody does my curriculum. And then I know they're <laughs> getting solid teaching and not just that I, I begin to empathize with that impulse for control. Instead of saying, um, you know, the, in Jeremiah, there's a prophesied new covenant that the author of Hebrews picks up and repeats and says, um, that in the new covenant, no one will teach his brother or his neighbor saying, know the Lord, for they will all know him from the least to the greatest. Um, because the Holy Spirit is in all of you, you can read and understand. And yes, we need community and we need guidance and we need to confront bad ideas. But... Um, but ideally, you're all like the Bereans taking what John or myself preach and teach and then looking at Scripture yourself with the Holy Spirit, discerning truth from error, okay, that, and, and, and trying, to, trying to get people to understand this, you don't need someone like me to lead your small group. You and your small group can read and listen to the Holy Spirit and understand, maybe not perfectly, it's like, you know, their first grade, we don't teach calculus, right? <laughs> but first graders can do basic addition. You know, so you can read and you can understand. Then the more you read, the more you understand, and and uh, you grow in that, grow in that until you're doing calculus. Okay. All right. So now let's actually talk about what the what <laughs> the imagery that is in this uh, part of Isaiah 32. Okay. So he's talking about women at ease, okay, uh, who are smug. Now, is that saying not responsible? Yeah, it's saying it's these are the the wealthy elites, the the women who, yeah, right? Think they're better than that. I, I, exactly. All right, because they're the ones who. Who think that? Uh, well, I, I have no needs. Uh, Beatitudes: Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Okay, or the uh, the Luke's version: Blessed are you who are poor, but woe to you who are rich. Okay, so so he's using these uh, wealthy women. As an illustration, because he's not saying, okay, well, you guys are going to, you ladies are going to suffer, but no one else. Well, no, everybody's going to. Um, then he starts talking about the fruit crops will, will fall. The harvest will never take place. Tremble, you women of East. Throw off your complacency. Strip off your pretty clothes. Put on burlap to show your grief. Okay. Um, Beat your breasts in sorrow for your bountiful farms, for your fruitful grapevines. The land will be overgrown. Um, 
in Isaiah, I think we see uh, this idea of grapevines as a common image. Uh, he brings up again and again. Um, in Isaiah chapter 5, he has the song about the Lord's vineyard. Uh, talking about how the Lord uh, planted a vineyard, uh, put up a watchtower for it, a wine press, uh, waited for a harvest of sweet grapes, but the grapes that grew were bitter. So this idea of a grapevine uh, becomes used as an image for God's people. God's people that were supposed to be offering good grapes but have always produced bitter, sour grapes. And here he's talking about the, this grapevine. The, the grapevines are going to be overgrown with thorns and briars. In other words, God's people. All right, so you, you women at ease, get ready to not be at ease. Get ready to mourn because bad is coming. All right? Yeah. From the Western perspective. Yeah. So 32, 1 through 8 is they've used man, men, he, and then 9 through 20, they've used she. Do you think there's a reason for that, or do you think they're just all encompassing? Tomorrow, am I just thinking of that in a Western point of view? Uh, give me just a second here. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not necessarily sure he's deliberate, like, it, yeah, I think, I think he's just pulling up the, the image of, of the wealthy women because, because the one through a, he talks about like the, the righteous King. Um, and I don't think he's trying to draw a comparison between the righteous male and the at ease females. I don't think that's what he's doing. Then he goes on to talk about the scoundrels and the fools. Um, but I don't necessarily see a connection between them and the, the at ease women. Um, so I, I think he's just kind of switching uh, metaphors here. So, but that, that is a good question because that, um, because that, that could be part of the imagery is, you know, okay, you got the foolish man, and then you got his foolish wife. <laughs> you know, so so good question, but I I don't see any obvious connections. Part of the goes back to the people again. It doesn't think it does it woman anymore, distinctly by itself anymore. Yeah. So really, then you're saying that like nine on down to there, maybe the really important word is going to place. Oh yeah. Not, you know, like whether it's Neil and he, he'd just be saying, well, you've seen what these people, what they do as an example. Yeah. But he's talking to everybody. Yes. Yes. Um, so the wilderness, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so this, so cultivated land, cities, is kind of seen as the blessing. Whereas the wilderness taking over, because, okay, you have a garden, you have a nice landscape, it looks beautiful, you let it go, the weeds are going to overrun, it, it looks wild. Um, so that's kind of the, the idea here is, you know, you imagine those uh, see movies uh, about like post-apocalyptic world where, you know, you have lions running free in New York City because they, they got out of the New York Zoo. Uh, trees growing up through the, through the sidewalk and the, and the asphalt. It's, you know, all of, all of you humans' hard work is being undone. Um, until at last the Spirit is poured out on us from heaven. Then the wilderness will become a fertile field, and the fertile field will yield bountiful crops. 
See, Mike says fruitful field is deemed a forest. Yeah, now, you know, I, huh. when that happened, it, uh, that's uh, ESV, and I thought, oh, is a forest better than a fruit? You know, you want yeah. like an evolution of the thing. I was just, you know, going taking it to the next level, which I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to I'd have to dive deeper into the Hebrew to see why they. Yeah, but it's like okay, uh, the the blessing is being rescinded. It's it's going back to wilderness until the spirit comes, and then it reverses. Now, is he talking about land? Or, or is he talking about hearts? Mm -hmm. Because what does God ultimately want to see? Um, you know, a hundred acre field with a, a great yield of corn? Or men and women who produce the fruit of the Spirit? Okay. Uh, and in this time, justice will rule in the wilderness and righteousness in the fertile field. And this righteousness will bring peace, quietness, and confidence forever. People will live in safety, quietly at home, and they will be at rest. Mm -hmm. Hebrews talks about there is coming a time of rest for the people of God. A Sabbath rest. Mm -hmm. Joshua, the people followed Joshua into the land of Canaan. They battled, took the land. And then they had rest, rest from the wilderness wanderings, rest from the fighting, driving out the Canaanites. But it wasn't the ultimate rest. There's coming a day of, of ultimate rest. Even if the forest should be destroyed and the city torn down, the Lord will greatly bless his people. Wherever they plant seed, bountiful crops will spring up, their cattle and donkeys will graze freely. Okay. Can I ask another question? Yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not sure what to, to say on it, but like, as as believers in that, we it seems like we kind of walk a righteousness type road, you know, in that we don't want to be pharisaical, you know, and the other side of that, and yet. Like in 17 there, you know, my translation says, you know, the effect of righteousness will be peace. And the result of righteousness will be quiet and trust. Quietness and trust forever. And so, you know, it seems like that's such good things that as a church, even this church like right here, that that would be something that we would really want to work toward, which is kind of the Anna thing. How do you say it? Okay. Antithesis of the culture today. And how do we do that without us falling into the trap of, yeah. you know, I mean, that's, but <laughs> it seems like the benefit of this is so. Yeah. No, I, I think you're, we try to overcomplicate it a lot of times. So the, the Greek, the Hebrew, um, gets translated in a couple of ways. One, righteousness. One, justice. Okay. But they both have the same kind of, kind of root here. A lot of times when we talk about righteous, righteousness deals with our uh, responsibilities before God. Justice is dealing with our responsibilities with other people. So the, the just person is a person who, who fulfills their responsibilities towards other people, whatever those responsibilities might be. Um, so we have a responsibility when we drive to not drive recklessly and put other people at, in danger. Okay. Yeah. But you must have righteousness before you can have justice. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, justice may have different definitions. Yeah. 
yeah the the what are those ethical obligations towards towards other people um but in the same way but the idea here is is what what are you what do you owe the other person so righteousness what do i owe god do i give god what i owe him that that's righteousness okay and of course the pharisees would say well i have a strict adherence, external adherence to the law. And Jesus says, yeah, but you're neglecting the inside of the cup and dish. All right. Cause we also owe him our hearts and our thoughts and, and anything else. And then what do we owe other people? So basically two things, what do we owe God? What do we owe other people? How would Jesus answer that? What do we owe God? What do we owe other people? First two commands. Or the three yeah. things John talked about. Yeah. Today. Yeah. Micah, wasn't it? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Jared used uh, uh, yeah. Micah 6. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Okay. Or even shorter definition love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Well, not just your neighbor, but Jesus also says, love your enemies. <laughs> yeah. So Paul circles back around to this in um, a couple of places and says, love is the fulfillment of the law. So if you love your neighbor, you don't steal, you don't lie to them, you don't murder them, you don't have uh, commit adultery with their spouse, all right? If you love God, you know, you're, you're not putting any other gods or anything before him, right? You're, you're not profaning his name. Now, if we set this as our goal, and, and agape love talks about, uh, I love uh, the way John has defined, he defined it once in his sermons, but doing what is absolutely best for the other person. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, there's those definitions of love. Well, love means I just ignore them and, and let them do whatever they want. Well, parents know that's not loving your child to just let them do whatever. Absolute love for my child may mean yanking his butt when he's trying to play in the street so he didn't get hit by a car. <laughs> okay. So whatever we're thinking about, should I do this or should I do this? What is the absolute loving, most loving thing for that person? Is it having a hard conversation? Is it overlooking, you know, um, love keeps no record of wrongs, but rejoices in the truth. Are there things that I should overlook in a person? Because right now there's other things that are more like, for example, if somebody's a smoker, do I confront them about their smoking or do I talk to them about Jesus first? <laughs> Maybe let's start with Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Phil and then so, Jeff. You, know, you see all over town the signs that says be kind. Mm -hmm. If they said, of course, who would connect? Follow Jesus, then that follows. It's, a, it's, it's supposed to, kind, yes. Without that, what does that mean? Right. Jeff. <laughs> so I'm looking at 15. Okay, verse 15 here, where he says, Until the Spirit is poured out from on high in the wilderness, becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is deemed a forest. That's me, isn't it? And in other words, until God's Spirit, which indwells in me because of my accepting Christ and what he's done for me, when that's poured out and, and I enable that, then the wilderness of myself becomes a fruitful field and not only does it become a fruitful field but as I mature 
it would become even more forced. You know, up where there is, I guess I'm thinking of like steadfastness. And Love, joy, peace, patience, yeah. kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Mm -hmm. Against such things there is no law. Well, that would be Eastern. Thinking, reading the scripture, I mean, I'm not saying Eastern bad. I'm just saying that would be more of a way of thinking at that as opposed to specifically it's going, oh, Lewis is going to be turned to a really good field, good crops. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's recognizing that he's using imagery here. Um, not the focus isn't how's the farm doing, the focus is how's the heart doing. Okay, then can I take 16 and 17 and these other ones and can I apply them to myself? Then, what if I am the spirit is poured out upon me, this will happen, and then I'll be able to, to judge rightly, like you know, John was talking about today. Yeah, okay. yeah. Now the the only caution, because I think that's a, I think it's a valid application, but we also want to remember that our our Western side, our Western mind, tends towards individualism, where the Eastern mind tends towards community. So he's not just talking. These are how individuals relate to God, but this is how the community relates to God. So as a church family, as the body of Christ, as the Holy Spirit moves through us, not just me, but through us, then we experience the, the righteousness that uh, becomes a fertile field that brings peace quietness and confidence forever because let's face it if uh one person out of a hundred have the the, the uh, peace and quiet and righteousness of jesus but the 99 don't how quiet and peaceful <laughs> is that going to be well, i'm thinking like with groupers you know like i kind of believe that you know god put me in this position mm -hmm. to do this so how do you now, you know, in other words, so it's not, a, is it enough to uh, do this on your own individual? I've become this way and hopefully people see that in you and think that, or is there a, how do we want to say it, an action or something that I need to be, I'm not, yeah, I so, don't know what to say. Yeah, so we, so we have our, our individual relationship with Christ. Yeah, and, and we are seeking to follow him, but we also have a call to help. I mean, we, you can't just leave and say, no, I'm done with all you people. I'm just going to be a hermit in the, in the woods and just me and God and all the rest of you can go to hell. In community, we seek to model. And sometimes out of love, like Isaiah is doing here, we challenge. There's sometimes we're called to confront and let people know, hey, that that attitude you're damaged or that act, what you are doing, you know, the way you're talking to your spouse is not modeling the kind of righteousness, justice, and love that you know you're called to. Okay. So again, that idea of what is absolutely best for this person there might be times where it's absolutely best for me to keep my mouth shut and let the holy spirit work on them and not interfere but there might be times that i'm the absolute best is the holy spirit saying jeff you need to have a conversation with so and so mm -hmm. and and call have a come to jesus meeting thank you um just I could, like, you know, we uh, the good crop and the good harvest uh, as a result of the farmer following. Yeah. Is it not a progression to move into the forest in that God creation? Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
I plant a seed, Apollos water it, but God gives the growth. And yeah, you don't, you don't get tomatoes overnight. You don't get apple trees and orchard. I wonder if orchard might be the, the, even the better translation than forest. Um, you don't get an orchard overnight. It is, it is growth. It, it takes time. Okay. Last thing. Then I, I got to get downstairs. The orchard is the result of the farmer's following. The forest is God's creation. That's it. Yeah. All right. Let me pray for us. And, uh, yeah, Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for wonderful conversations with uh, my brothers and sisters. And thank you for your Holy Spirit who is leading all of us. I pray that you will give us uh, continual eyes to see and ears to hear uh, what you would have us learn and also what you would have us uh, teach and say and do in the lives of others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It's kind of an interesting thing that you were just mentioning there, the difference between 